We are joined by Father David Michael, a priest of the Diocese of Houston. Father, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me and this awesome project that you're working on. Great to be with you guys and to talk a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got to say, first of all, every time I see your collar now, I think of you like eating yogurt with it. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry you have to deal with that image, but I literally have done it. It's not just a joke. I have done it. It's, it's very useful. Yeah, well, I mean, now I'm like, man, I'm going to have to have like a, a collar or something in my pocket now, you know? It works great. That is awesome. Well, obviously you love the Eucharist and so do Angelo and I. That's what's led us to this movie. So we're going to kick it off by asking you, how did the Eucharist transform your life? Yeah, so, I mean, the Eucharist is the reason I'm a, I'm a priest, 100%. Um, I, for me personally, being able to be close to the Eucharist as an altar server growing up, was huge. I mean, when I was 11, 12 years old, I thought, gosh, if this is really Jesus and I'm up on the altar serving the body of Jesus, then this is probably the most important thing I'm doing every week. Um, and that's how I kind of started that journey started for me, Eucharistic adoration. Um, I, uh, the morning of my first communion, um, my dad says, I told him, I, I said, dad, I think this is going to change everything. And he always likes to tell that story. And it, and it did change everything for me. Um, I ended up going on a silent retreat when I was 16. And that kind of kickstarted my discernment of the priesthood. But um, one of the things the priest said on that retreat was that um, he said, objectively, the most pleasing thing we can do for God is to go to mass. And, you know, I internalized that. Um, and I started going to daily mass at that point. And it wasn't until later that I think I realized why that was so true. And, and the reason, of course, is that the mass is the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary in full obedience and submission to the will of the father being made truly present again. So the most pleasing thing to the father was the gift of love of the son and obedience. So at mass, we were able to participate in that and to offer that to God again, which is why it's so pleasing that we, that we go to mass certainly every week, but um, those are able to go, you know, multiple times during the week or daily. Um, is huge. Um, and then for me, being able to become a priest and to be able to actually change bread and water, into the, bread and wine to the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Um, I, mean, I find myself when I'm consecrating thinking like, how, does, how can this even exist? Like, how is it even possible that I get to be a part of this? You know, it's like, it's just absolutely insane to me. So the Eucharist transformed my life when I was seven, transformed it again when I was 16 and continues to transform it every single day. I would like to dissect a little bit more this this part. I mean, because I think I mean many people would be really interesting about. I mean, when uh, you said, I mean, uh, you start as a, a ultra 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 server, ultra boy, and try to make it really see how these uh, young ultra boy they are doing now mass, how they can relate it to what uh, you could could tell now these stories. I mean, so there is any other stories uh, you have uh, when you when you were doing? I mean, any kind of things that I mean. Uh, really capture you find something something that really hits you in your heart and i mean something something like a different and i mean some uh, some problems you you were experienced when you were doing there some mistakes there's any funny story any kind of things but i think it would be nice to see for the young people how they can relate it to to your conversion yeah yeah well what's cool about being an alt server is that you're not it's you're not strictly necessary right the priests can do mass without servers they can put everything on the altar to start with and they don't really need anybody else. But as with everything with God, he doesn't necessarily need us, but he wants to use us. And so part of what's beautiful about altar serving is that, you know, let, let's say I, I had the book as a kid and the priest says, let us pray. It's going to be very awkward if I don't bring the book forward for him. Right? He can't really continue mass until I come forward with the book. So in a beautiful way, I have been made, even as an you know, eight, nine year old little boy, I've been made a necessary part of this. And I bring forward the book and then, and then, and I bring forward the vessels Then the altar and then the, the priest then uses the vessels in that book to make Christ present. So suddenly as a server, I have a very real role in Christ being made present now for the community. Um, and it, you know, certainly, you know, things go wrong and that's part of the fun. I remember there was one year we were doing the, um, it was the Easter vigil mass. So biggest mass of the year, you know, is that late at night and one of the older guys, doing the uh, incense was in the front incense and doing the consecration and i think he did it too hard and it flipped and basically dumped all the coals out probably six eight feet wide 
they were just coals <laughs> burning in the carpet and got everybody had to rush forward. They were trying to stomp out the little fires that were burning into the carpet. We had to replace the carpet and everything. It was pretty amazing. That guy actually is becoming a priest too. He's going to be a priest um, in the spring. Both of us ended up becoming priests. Um, yeah, culpa, yeah, culpa, so, yeah, culpa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, lots of funny moments like that, but I think a great analogy, right. For how the Lord wants to use us, you know, even with our faults, even though we're imperfect, he, he makes, makes us a part of, of what he wants to do. And I think as an all shiver, especially you're really able to experience that on a, on a deep level. And now I continue to, to serve at the altar now as a priest. Uh, yeah. How, sorry, I mean, how you, when you were there, there is, there is uh, any other thoughts that cross your mind when you're looking the priest to the mass. And I mean, any things that really touch your heart is, 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 is I mean, uh, I don't know any kind of like a, you've done it for a long time and I mean so so it's not like you did just one time and I mean so there is there's, there's any other so I mean I heard I mean uh, my godfather was uh, uh helping some Padre Pio uh, doing the mass for, for for 25 years so he told us all these crazy little things about wow. being inspired about him uh, doing this kind of stuff so I'm kind of wondering is like a and that's what made him become his personal assistant for 25 years. He didn't ever want to let it go. So he says, this, is, this is too awesome. And I mean, to see him levitating from the floor and they, they were pulling him down for don't go too high. I mean, seeing him like really sweating and, and scratching his uh, his forehead because I mean, he actually had the crown uh, of Thorne Spin. Yeah. I mean, really making him bleeding and stuff. So there is so many beautiful moments happen. Is anything happen? to you by observing any kind of, I don't want to say re re revelation, but any revel internal moment for you? Oh, many things. The one that jumps out to me, this happened to me as a, as a priest. There was one day um, I was called to anoint a lady who was about to die. At, she was at like a nursing home. And I think that happens pretty regularly. We get emergency calls. And so I kind of dropped everything and I rushed over there. And uh, I went to the room and there was the lady there who was, who was dying. And then her daughter was there with her. And the, the daughter said, Hey father, I know you're kind of in a rush getting ready for everything, but just so you know, my mom's on an all liquid diet. She can't have any solid food. And I kind of thought, gosh, it's going to be kind of tough with the Eucharist because even though it's Jesus, it kind of has the consistency of sort of a dry cracker, you know? So that could be hard for her to swallow, but we were in such a rush because she was dying. I thought we're just going to kind of worry about it when the time comes. So I did all the prayers. I anointed her and everything. And then it came down time for, for communion. And I usually keep the, the host when I go for emergency calls, you know, in the little gold picks, right? That little gold container that we, um, we transport the host. And I usually keep it in my chest pocket here. And I went to um, get it out of my pocket. And I noticed that my shirt was like all wet. It was like soaking wet. And I was like, gosh, that's so weird. Like, where did this water come from? Like, did it come out of my car when I was driving over? Did I run into something? But I was like, I don't have much time to figure this out. Like, this lady's dying. I'll worry about that later, you know. So I pull the pics out and I open it up and I see the host there. And it's like the host has been soaked in water. Wow. It was like soaking wet. And I, it, like, I, it could still hold together. Like, I could pick it up. But it was like, like frankly, like all like wiggly. And I just kind of held it up and it was hanging there. And I looked at the daughter and I said, your mom, your mom is on an all liquid diet. Could she have this? And the lady was like, yeah, I think, I think that would be perfect. And wow. so I gave it to the lady and, and I realized in that moment, it sure seemed like Jesus was preparing himself in a way that this woman could receive him. Yeah. And I realized then that like, isn't that what Jesus is always doing with the Eucharist with all of us? That people often will say, like, why doesn't it always transform, not just transubstantiate, but transform into flesh and blood? Because then wouldn't that be easier for us to believe if it was like blood and bones and sinews? Well, it might be easier to believe, but it'd be much more difficult to eat. It'd be almost impossible to eat what actually tastes and look like flesh, right? And instead, he comes to us truly as body and blood, but in what looks and tastes like a piece of bread, which like what, what's easier to eat than that, right? Like what's easier than, than what looks and tastes like bread. And so just like Jesus came to that woman so gently and prepared himself in a way she could receive him. So, so at every single mass we celebrate, the Lord comes to us so gently in a way that we can receive him. Um, so that was, yeah, that was a super powerful moment to me, for me, 
that really opened up the the whole mystery of of why the Eucharist is the way it is. That's amazing! Wow, I uh, I've never heard any any story like that. So thanks for sharing that, Father. So we uh, this past weekend there was someone that came to Mass who's never been to a Catholic church before, and um, one of my friends was asking, you know, can you tell about the Eucharistic miracle movie? So I explained the Eucharistic miracle movie, and then he said, "What is the Eucharist?" And I don't know if I've ever been asked that question by an adult, you know, and it, it was like, I have no clue what you're talking about. So we explained it and he said, oh, so has a Eucharistic miracle happened at this church? And I was like, wow, what? A, it's it's so cool to see these questions that arise that, you know, oh, if there's Eucharistic miracles, they should happen everywhere. But it's like, no, our, our faith is is in Jesus's words, you know, and sometimes he manifests himself, but most of the time he doesn't. Because can you imagine if every parish had a Eucharistic miracle? <laughs> yeah, right. that'd be very interesting but father going back to the altar server comment so i uh i was serving for a mass uh, a couple weeks ago and my sons had never seen me serve before i have identical twin boys that are four so oh, when nice fantastic and surplus on they said dad you're a priest <laughs> <laughs> my wife actually had to take them out of the mass be, because or out of church because they wanted to like join me up at the uh, altar, you know. Oh, so, that's amazing! <laughs> they were like crying, like I want to be with that. So they they always love seeing that. So we, Angelo and I, and Father, we definitely recommend getting your sons uh, into altar serving. It's a game changer. Oh, hundred percent. I think it's a big reason I'm a I'm a priest now. Um, is to be close to Jesus in the Eucharist. It, it changes everything. Yeah. Well, so let me ask you. You said you were 16 and you went on a, a retreat that really changed your life. How did you? persevere through um all of the culture or cultural pressures of you know being faithful to the church and especially like in the moral life yeah so i mean i would be the first to humbly acknowledge that there was just a lot of grace in my life a lot of grace i was saved from a lot of the things that tend to ensnare people in this culture i attribute that to my my parents a lot they did a fantastic job raising us my dad quick side note did a lot of a lot of pro-life work before I was born, went to jail like 13 times. It was all sanctioned by the bishop and everything, um, but was a really good example of me of for like, hey, whatever Jesus asks, you go do it. You know, whatever, whatever he asks, you do it. And so for me, like, you know, when Jesus calls, everything's on the table. And uh, it was a huge struggle, especially with um, discerning celibacy. I mean, when you're 16, 17, 18 years old, the idea of never like, having another girlfriend, never getting married just sounds crazy, you know? Um, but I felt that, that, that call deeply and it was affirmed at, at different signs. And at the, at the end of the day, for me, I wanted to do something meaningful with my life. And I thought like, what would be more impactful for other people than to literally give them Jesus in the Eucharist and to forgive their sins in the person of Christ in confession? Like, if that's what it means to be a priest, then um, what else would I want to do with my life? You know, like that would probably be worth giving my life to. You know, I tend to tell people, you know, it's you start off to, to your point, like the, the world looks very attractive. There's a lot of things. And it's hard when you feel like the Lord maybe is calling you to give up a lot of stuff, it, even good things. Right. Good things like marriage, you know, um, having your own job, you know, uh, having to give that up, give up, you know, where you live, you know, that the the, uh, <laughs> that the bishop tells you where you go, where you live. And you kind of think of all that and you think, oh, gosh, I sure hope I don't have to be a priest. And then you look at what being a priest means and you discover that it, in its essence, it's not just performing functions. Being a priest means you are so united with the person of Jesus Christ on a deep ontological level that when you take a piece of bread and you say in the first person, this is my body, then it becomes Christ's body. And that when someone comes to confession and I say in the first person, I absolve you from your sins. Jesus absolves their sins. Like Jesus and I are so close that when I say it, he does it every single time. I say it, he does it every time. It's crazy, but the priest has the authority of God on earth to do the work of Christ. And so you go from saying, you know, gosh, I sure hope I don't have to be a priest to saying, oh my gosh, I sure hope he chooses me. You know, like I sure hope he chooses me to be a part of this and I will... I will give up anything to be part of his work here on earth. Um, so I, it's definitely, you know, to answer your question, it's it's hard to give things up and it's hard not to get lost in the, the weeds of the world. 
But I think when you have those moments of grace, when you clearly see what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a priest, what it means to follow Christ, I mean, it, it really is worth everything. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I tried, sadly, that wasn't all my call. I mean, I tried to go in Italy, I tried to go as a priest, as a monk, but uh, I had this extremely passion about it. I was stay up all night, all day long, and I mean, just reading Bible, go adoration and stuff. I mean, I would have this couple of years, it was like a crazy on fire, but I guess I guess here there's some different plans for 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 for, for me. But so I kind of like a, I really really admire it. I mean uh, that uh, you did the discernment, and I mean uh, you you really taught uh, taught uh, taught well through. I mean which is uh, it's awesome. I mean uh, uh, did, there's uh, any saints uh, any any you read so much you had to study so much theology you had to do all this kind of stuff. There is any of the saints any of the reading that I mean. Uh, spoke to you more, get to you more closer to to the Eucharist or get more closer to become a more persona Christi in uh, in in the altar. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, oh gosh, yeah. I mean, for me, just really on my heart through seminary and as a young priest, it's definitely like Padre Pio and St. John Biani. Um, Padre Pio, uh, just such a great example of, of being all in for the fire, for the salvation of souls, you know, and um and John Vianney as well. You know, John Vianney, we just had his feast day recently. He's the patron saint of a parish priest. And uh, um, it's funny because I was reading an article that morning on his feast day about his his heart is incorruptible, right? So it's, And uh, there was a guy who was traveling all around the country with his heart and everything. And I was reading the article and I was like, I wonder why I'm reading this. It was kind of random, you know, but I was like, okay, it's interesting. That afternoon, I had a lady um, between confessions, it was outside of confession, came in and talked to me and said, hey, Father, just so you know, there's a a 10 year old boy in the area who's about to have open heart surgery. Like his chest is open and he's about to do a, a heart transplant where he gets a new heart. And it kind of hit me in that moment. Like, yeah, like I think John Vianney wants to give all of us new hearts on his feast day. You know, he wants to give all of us a heart transplant because he had such a deep, deep love for the Eucharist and for his people, for Christ in the Eucharist and, and, and then for Christ and his people. And uh, he used to pray this prayer every night, like, Lord, uh, grant me the conversion of my parish. Um, even if I have to suffer a, a hundred years of the sharpest pains, the worst pains, I'll do it. Only let my people be converted, which is just such a beautiful prayer, you know, um, and the way he spoke about about the Eucharist and uh, just his dedication day in and day out. It took a long time for him to get that little town on the same page. You know, he showed up. There were four bars in the town and I think one church. And uh, 200 people, almost nobody was going to mass. And, you know, we know 10 years later, he had 20,000 people coming to confession with him every year. I mean, it's just mind blowing. And all of that was the fruit of him every day offering the sacrifice of the mass, being available for confession and uh, it converted a whole generation. So um, the saints, I mean, that's the that's the model, right? Oh, yeah. And the replacing of the heart, right? We, we look at the Old Testament, like replace our heart of stone with the heart of flesh. And that's what I love. Is that all these Eucharistic miracles, it's the heart. Yeah. God could have chosen any organ for it to be revealed as. We know we don't just receive his heart. We receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity. But he revealed that in this in these miracles that it is his heart. Uh, especially because today there's such a heart issue that we want to yeah. we we have, have become so cold as a society and a world. So by receiving his heart, um, or you know, himself. It'll change our hearts. So I love hearing that. And I wanted to ask you from the standpoint of confession, how uh, I, I know like during Lent, you had this very long uh, time that you were available for confessions and you like kept a list. Can you share that? Yeah. Well, one, you know, for me, I'm very passionate about confession really because it's so connected with the Eucharist, because if we have sinned, we can't go to the Eucharist, right? Not because God doesn't love us or want us, but because we need to be reconciled and be brought back into communion so we can receive communion. So I'm very passionate about confession because it is the gateway and, and it's the ship that brings you to the real presence of Christ, you know? So um, I just, you know, you mentioned the confession times. I just felt like even as a young priest, I, I, I quickly realized that around Easter, people really wanted to go to confession before Easter which we definitely want our people going to confession regularly, like every month or two, maybe even more than that. But um, I, I think there is something beautiful about as people prepare for the resurrected Christ, 
they want to have some kind of spiritual resurrection themselves. And just as Jesus during Holy Week is going through his passion, they, they want to have some kind of death to sin themselves. And so, you know, just for me, if I was running a business, um, when the when the customer wants to buy the product, you get a bunch more of the supply of the product, right? You know, like, you know, <laughs> the, the grocery stores before Thanksgiving open up all their lanes and make sure they have plenty of uh, uh, plenty of inventory right before Christmas time. You know, the, the Apple store, Target, everybody has plenty of iPhones and plenty of technology to sell before because they know some people want it. And so for me, I thought, gosh, as a church, Easter is like our Super Bowl week. Let's um, let's make it very available so that the demand will respond to the supply. And so I asked my pastor, I just said, hey, what do you think about me doing confessions, you know, most of the day, every day during Holy Week? Um, Because I'd grown up listening to these stories about, you know, John Vianney doing, Padre Pio doing confessions 17, 18 hours. And I thought, you know, if if they were doing this almost year round, I can do it for five days a week. You know, I can do it for that long. And uh, it's funny because when I showed the times to my my pastor, I kind of thought he was going to be like, this is a little bit too much, you know, and I would kind of be off the hook. But instead, he was like, "Yeah, sure, go ahead." And I was like, "Oh, okay. I guess, I guess we're doing it." You know, and um, I mean, I am I'm a pretty stubborn person, so when I say I'm going to be there, I knew I'd show up, and uh, I thought it would be a trickle of people. Like, I would sit in the office working on my homily, and like every hour or two, somebody would come in and knock and say, "Hey, can I go to confession?" You know, thought that'd be kind of cool. Um, I I didn't expect for it to be like pretty continuous. And when I drove in the parking lot at 6 a.m. the first morning that Monday, I think there were three cars in the parking lot and people were waiting. And um, there were a couple short breaks. But for the most part, I mean, it was constant, the line of people and uh, just kept growing, you know, as we got closer and closer to Easter. So to the point where on that good Friday, um, I was in there probably 17 hours. We went from 6 a.m. to to midnight, only broke to do the veneration of the cross. We heard, I mean, I heard 400 confessions. The other priests there probably heard a couple hundred themselves too. And uh, by the end of the week, it was like over a thousand confessions on the week. I mean, it was mind blowing. It was really tiring, but it was like, like what else would I want to be doing with my life than this? Like, this is everything to me. And so just, uh, you know, spiritually, it was really exhausting. But of course, I mean, when there's, there has to be a price paid, you know, for sin and um, we're all in it together and. So I was just super, super thankful to be a priest. And we've done, we've done it a few times since then, since that first year. And hopefully uh, hope to continue that because um, salvation of souls, you know, is what we're all about. That, that is fantastic. Yeah, that's totally right. And it's like, there was a one time, so it's like a, a, a friend, a priest, he asked me, Angelo, tell me some story about San Padre Pio, about uh, I want to be more like him. And I mean, and, and I mentioned the fact that when that, uh, he was going, he was going like a really through 14 hours nonstop in confessions. I mean, and uh, he said, Oh, no, 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 more than one hour. I cannot do it. I cannot do it. I cannot do it. And so they say, You, the gift he get, he had uh, to be able to, and I, we, we thought he told me so many amazing stories about reading people's mind. Uh, and, uh, and before even they, they, they sit down there was because uh, he suffered and he gave, uh, he gave us so many hours of, confession i mean you don't get to the price before uh, <laughs> before the hard work and i mean so so it's uh, it's amazing i mean it, i mean you you embrace it that one of both of us san giambiani and uh, san padre pio for people that they are no catholics uh, or they are not fully understanding the why just a priest can confess and i mean and why a um, I cannot just pray myself. Can you tell about some Bible passages or what the church is teaching? Because I think it's like you say perfectly, is is the is the you can get the communion, the, the communion if you don't understand fully the confession too. Because I mean they are they are in, interacting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know, confession wasn't my idea. You know, it, it, it's crazy to me that God gives this authority to men. Right. I mean, they says that in scripture, when Jesus forgives sins, it says, and, and they rejoice that God had given this authority to men, that Jesus as a man had authority to forgive sins. It was crazy when Jesus did it 2000 years ago. It's crazy when he does it through me today. I mean, I admit it's crazy, but God is the one who forgives and he gets to choose how he forgives. Right. And I think in scripture, it is pretty clear when, you know, when Jesus says um, he gives you the, 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 the keys to the kingdom, 
to Peter. And then he says to all the apostles, what sins you retain are retained, um, what sins you forgive are forgiven them. And then, of course, you know, I always look at scripture and then I look at how the church developed their tradition over time. And um, certainly confession has taken different forms now. Um, but the angle I often use with people, um, one, I had somebody, somebody said this to me the other day, and I thought it was fantastic. It was in an RCA class. They said, um, you would never baptize yourself right? We always know somebody else needs to baptize you. And why do you baptize? Well, because you're forgiven of sin and you're incorporated into the community, right? And God loves you. And if you're extraneous or deserted either by, your, by yourself, he loves you, but you can't baptize yourself still, you know? You need somebody else to do that. And confession, what does it do? Very similar to baptism, it removes sin and it reincorporates you into the community of God. It doesn't make sense to confess your sins yourself. You need to have somebody else to bring that, bring that for you. Um, and so ultimately with people, I get that they, people don't want to go to confession because it's super awkward and uncomfortable to tell your sins to somebody. I go to confession too. It's awkward. I get it. But I think if we recognize that it's not God trying to like embarrass us, it's God tr- forgiving us and then helping us be forgiven in a way that we know that we're forgiven and that we can find true healing and peace. Because if you sit in your room and you say, God, I'm sorry for this and this and this, Okay. I mean, that, that, that's kind of where it ends. And then you leave your room. When you go to confession, and you say, I'm sorry for this and this and this. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. But then you hear the priest say, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. You hear that, you know it, and you can now live from that place of peace that ultimately confession, um, yeah, it's hard. But it is such a gift to hear audibly and to know that we've been forgiven in that moment is just super, super healing. Like, I think people who just want to confess their sins by themselves to God, I tend to say, like, I think God loves you more than that. Like, I think he wants you to have a deeper experience of his mercy than you sing in a room by yourself, telling yourself that you're forgiven. I I think he wants more for you than that. Um, And it really is a joyful moment because, you know, as a priest, I deal with lots of stuff with people. Um, that is very hard to fix. People come in with like family issues. I can talk to them. I can pray with them. I can give them some tips, but we probably can't fix all their family issues today. People come in with hard marriages. I can pray with them. I can refer them to a counselor, but I probably can't fix all the marriage issues. They have finance stuff, job stuff, all kinds of things. I maybe can't fix that today, but if you walk in with sin and you're sorry with your sin, hey, we can fix that today. We can fix it right now. And like, that's the beauty of confession. Because in a world of a lot of things that you can't fix, Jesus already fixed sin. And, and he already won the mercy. And you just have to show up and, and you have to receive it. It's interesting because uh, when you think about it, the only thing that we own fully is our sin, right? That's the only thing that, that we can fully take ownership over. So by giving them to Jesus in confession, it is such a grace. Amen. Yeah, it's a form of a, a, a accountability too. I mean, because it's I think I think it, it takes it, ta- it takes some guts to go to some priest and telling them so you have, you have to own it. And I mean, and you have to say that and uh, to some people say that when they do something really bad, they like it to go to some different priests. And I mean, but I think uh, to be able to go to the priest that I mean that uh, can recognize you. I, I prefer like it to see it because I mean because that gives me the accountability to have some time some somebody to, to say. Angelo, come on, you have to move, you have to push, you have to do something, you have to, like, you, you can fix it. I mean, that one is like being in a sport with a coach. I mean, it's like a, having somebody can kind of like a guide you and say, okay, you screw up, go ahead, fix it. Now, whatever. It, it gives you the, the power. I realize you say, okay, I can do tomorrow. There's, there's, God forgive me all the time. And I mean, he's going to forgive me all the time. And I mean, so I think uh, that probably is a good element too. Oh, for sure. That accountability. Because yeah, the point here is is to grow spiritually, right? To to be forgiven, but also to grow. And I think, you know, you certainly can go to some other priests who've never seen before and you don't know. It works. That's better than nothing. But I think if you really want to lean into the growth portion of it, then going with a priest who knows you. The other thing I would say too, if it's a priest that you know, then it's a priest who probably loves you. If you go with this, you have to know someone to love them. And if it's a stranger priest, he can love the idea of you, but he doesn't know you enough to really love you but if you go to your pastor the one who saw you growing up and the one who did your wedding and all that stuff he probably loves you so when you tell him your sins uh, he wants to help you get out of that 
but he also has a deep care for you as a person. So that's sort of how I feel as a priest. If somebody I know goes to confession with me, you know, I love them. Like that's my, my my first response is not judgment. It's like love and care for them. That's why you become a priest. So yeah, I think that's a really good point that you make. I think, I mean, if you think about it, if you think about it, Padre Pio, why everybody was going to San Padre Pio, right? They knew that, I mean, most likely he was going to say, to tell the do. you did this one like two years ago, you did this one 20 years ago, you did that on another. And I think that there is, probably psychologically, there is some form of charm to be able to have somebody that, I mean, can put you in line. I mean, can I, how, how, how can you unpack it? I mean, so you read for sure many beautiful things about both saints. And I mean, how, I mean, how can you probably unpack this one too? Oh, no, I think you said it well, that there's a value to somebody who will tell you the truth, right? Like, like that's what love is. Love is, I, I there was a 10 year old girl I was talking to one time and I said, what do you, what does it mean to love someone? And she said, I think loving someone means being willing to tell them the truth. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're exactly right. And I think you're right. That's why people were drawn to Padre Pio because he was going to tell them the truth. He wasn't just going to say, don't worry about it. Don't, it's not a big deal. God loves you, whatever we mean by love there. And like, have a great day. He was going to say like, actually, you really screwed up here. You really screwed up here. And you've got to stop doing this because you're hurting yourself and you're hurting your family. And you're hurting the people around you. And God forgives you and you can start fresh. But just stop doing that stuff. And to your point, psychologically, it's like, wow, this man actually loves me because he was willing to tell me the truth, which is how Jesus was, right? So um, it, it is interesting that you're right. People, they went to Padre Pio not because they could hide things. And that was actually ultimately attractive to them. Yeah, you you totally think the opposite. And uh, it's it's amazing to see that. I never thought about that, Angela. That's, a, that's an awesome point there. When I'm preparing for a confession, my wife and I will do our examinations of conscience together. So- the Whoa. Is, how have I not loved you well, you know, since our last confession? Mm. And it's very painful sometimes, but it's very good. Um, because like you said, love, right? You, you want to go to someone who loves and that's, you know, and you can do the same thing with like family members and stuff like that. Um, right. I think probably at like the core of so much family discord is that lack of communication and clarity. Um, but that's, that could be a whole nother video right there. Right. <laughs> So, Father, you've obviously reached a lot of people. What do you get from those that aren't Catholic that when you share something on the Eucharist, they're like, that's crazy. Uh, what have you seen most effective in um, speaking the truth there? And uh, what have you seen that's maybe not as effective? Yeah. Well, you know what? I will say this is kind of interesting to me. Talking with non-Catholics, they tend to have mostly a lot of misconceptions about the Catholic faith and about the Eucharist and all these things. And that once they understand what we really teach, they tend to be like, oh, okay, well, yeah, maybe, maybe so. You know, like I have actually found a lot of non-Catholics to be pretty open, um, su surprisingly to me, um, to the Eucharist. And I think, um, you know, always going back to scripture, obviously is huge, but looking at how the church interpreted that scripture early on. Like when you look at the church fathers, you look at the way they were talking about the Eucharist. Um, the apostles, people after the apostles, the way they were teaching about the breaking of the bread and, 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 and the Lord's Supper, it was pretty clear that these guys did not just think this was like a fun community meal where they ate food. Like there was something much deeper to them that was going on. And I think that's probably the best thing to keep pointing towards um, to invite Protestants kind of into this, this beautiful mystery of the Eucharist is to say like, hey, what did the church that Jesus founded, what were they saying about uh, how are they interpreting his words on the Eucharist? Um, because, yeah, without the tradition of the church, you know, you can look at scripture and you can come to lots of different conclusions, you know. But if God cared enough to come suffer and die, don't you think he started something to kind of help guide us, which would be the church, I think. Oh, definitely. And Father, I'm excited for you to be able to see our, our scene of John 6 when this movie's done, because I'm pumped. Have you heard it preached? But to actually see him going back and forth with the Pharisees. Angela and I have seen it, of course, and it's just like, oh my goodness. Never before, like it's never been filmed before. I don't know why wow. in 2000 years, no one's ever done that, um, but that'll be in there. The CGI of transubstantiation will be unbelievable. Angela, you can go into that more if you'd like, but it's going to be amazing. Yeah, no, I think I, th I think it's a fascinating to be able to have in this, uh, all this gift about everything you learn, and theologically speaking, but as well, uh, uh, within uh, with, with, within uh, what the computer can do, what uh, what uh, editing, uh, what what the compositing, uh, what what the special effect can do, and incorporating uh, 
in a way that I mean, can uh, can be clear at least as much as possible. Obviously, you cannot show how it perfectly is, but I think there is so much, many beautiful testimony for saints, uh, for church fathers and stuff that they can put this piece of puzzle to together. I mean, and uh, and really helping to making people feeling that, I mean, that, I mean, uh, we were talking about the other day, I mean, we did an interview with this young kid. Uh, it's almost like uh, this, uh, uh, the, the Marvel movie. I mean, uh, the, it's kind of like a, a extra universe. I mean, it, I mean, they actually exist. I mean, they are coexisting in, on the same time. I mean, so, uh, yeah, I think, I think that would, that would be definitely awesome, awesome, awesome things to, to do. Yeah. Man, I'm excited to see it. When does it come out? We finished the filming. Uh, now we are just to, 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 hoping to get more donors for uh, for the, the post production. I mean, and uh, the more we get, the more fancy we can go with the special effects. I have all my I work at, uh, at Disney since I was 16, and now I'm I'm, I'm 51. So I definitely have lots of contact or uh, best animators, best special effect artists, and uh, I already spoke with them. They are on board, uh, but we. Those kind of people you need to pay for. I mean, they, so yeah, we hope. I mean, that I mean, somebody show up to our doors and says to say, "The Ukraine save me. Let me help you to say to save them too." I mean, because uh, we've been donating our time. And I mean, without taking one penny since these past three years. Wow. I mean, for for the good, of, we want to try to put everything on this one. I mean, because uh, then the fruit is going to come up after. I mean, but you can. Uh, some things you 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 need really need to put hours of work behind to it. I mean, so it's definitely uh, we hope we see. It. I mean, so as soon as we're going to get all the money, I mean, uh, within three, maximum six months, everything is going to be done. So, uh, uh -huh. and uh, the mother of Carla Cutis is behind us, uh, and uh, she really wanted to be that one. Uh, this movie to be part of. I mean. Uh, Carla Gutis was a big part of our our this movie, so we want to this one be for the for the for the big event for the for the Eucharist is going to be on the two thousand five. Uh, most likely they're going to make him saint that this, the, the same the, the same day. So we want to presenting this one with with that. Yeah. Oh, that sounds awesome! I'll be praying for it for sure. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, it's amazing, Father. We. Um... Angel and I've been working on this. It, we he just re reached out to me on Instagram and said, "Hey, you want to make a movie together?" And uh, <laughs> oh, and since then, and it's it's good to see like the faith that people have in the Eucharist. But it's really that, you know, like in everything that we do, right? All this talk that we've had on the Eucharist and confession, it's really like striving to to not just be like average, but you know, superb with God's grace. And uh, that's what we hope this movie will be because there's nothing really that. Angelo or I know of that you can give to anyone and say, let me know what you think about this. And this we're hoping to be yeah. the first thing to do that with. So needed. I love it. Where's been the most great example of faith in your in your life? And I mean, uh, as a people are, are, are around you, besides beside the saint, you already you already mentioned it. Uh, like people who have been examples of faith? Yeah. Oh, well, a good friend of mine, I think with Father Ryan Stallways. Um he just passed away, actually, uh, from uh, two years ago oh, from cancer. Okay. But we were ordained priests together, so he was a priest for two years, and um, he had cancer three times, and got her got got cancer this last time right before he got ordained a priest, and the second time before he got in a priest, and um, he preached a homily, basically saying that uh, he was confused by what what God was doing, like he was about to become a priest, and here he had this life threatening cancer. And he was thinking, you know, God, I don't really know what you're doing with this. This doesn't make a lot of sense. But he said his prayer at that time wasn't just to know God's will. It wasn't just to do God's will. It was to love God's will. Hmm. And, uh, you know, in seminary especially, we spend so much time wondering what God's will is and then praying for the strength to do God's will. But he didn't want that. He wanted to love God's will, too. And uh, up to the day he died, I mean, he was working really hard to hear confession. I mean, he was hearing hours of confession while he was super, super sick and in tons of pain and really just gave his entire priesthood for the people. So that was a very, I think, a good example for me of of a man with deep, deep faith and a good example of Christ, you know, giving his life, suffering for, for others because he believed so much in the mission of the church, 
um, in the mist and the power of the sacraments, the Eucharist confession, um, and in the work of Christ. So huge, huge example for me. It's awesome. How, uh, how long did you know him for? So we entered seminary together. So I knew him for seven years, all through seminary. And, uh, then we were priests for two years together before he passed. Yeah. How did, how do you think he had such like a solid faith? I mean, his parents were a huge part of that as well. Um, he had a lot of support in, in college. Um, but it was funny cause he was an engineer. So he, you know, I'm a more creative kind of person. He was very like logical, but I love that he applied that to, he was constantly thinking like, how can we do this better? How can we do this better? Like, how can we evangelize better? How can we provide the sacraments better? How can we preach better? He wanted to improve all the mechanics of things. <laughs> so I think that was a, you know, a great asset for the church. And it, 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 so I, I think similar <laughs> to that as well. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. You I understand. Am the creative, he's a, he's a, he's he's an engineer. Yeah, yeah. It's I, good to have both. You need both I, in the church. Exactly. I like send Angela this, and I'm like, it's literally like the meat and potatoes. And then Angela like adds all the flowery language and like all the awesome creative stuff. I love it. I'm like super not good with that stuff, so it's it's a great combination there. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You need that. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Well, Father, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Where can people learn more about you? Yeah, well, thank you for having me. This has been great. Appreciate the work you guys are doing. Um, yeah, people can find me on most of the social media stuff. My website's fatherdavidmichael.com, but also Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, that kind of thing. They can sign up for the newsletter on updates, working on a lot of, a lot of new projects. So hopefully people will find that edifying. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for, for, for your time, Father. Thank, Thank you guys for having me. Can you give a blessing to everybody who's watching this? Uh, this I would thing? love to. Yeah, Thank let's you. pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for the deep gift of, uh, of the presence of your Son, Jesus, in the Eucharist, his very body and blood to nourish us, to guide us, to bring us to deeper intimacy with you. I ask that you be with all those working on New Mana, working on this beautiful Eucharistic film, that you will um, continue to inspire them to persevere. Um, to uh, see the, the beauty of the work that they do and to share that gift with others. We ask that you be with all those watching this now and um, all those who will watch this film, that their hearts might be touched, deepened and enlivened um, by the glory uh, of your presence in the world, that they might live better lives in imitation of your son and better lives to manifest his sacrificial love to others. To the position of my hand, the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, the mighty God bless and keep you always the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.